This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. The biggest, the biggest icon in podcasting. Welcome in, everybody, to another episode of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast. This is episode 159. I think I got it right. I'm not 100% sure. We're going to go to the Doc in a few minutes to see what's going on with the actual episode number. But on today's episode, we do have some insight on what's going on with Big E as well as Lars Sullivan and what's going on with Aleister Black and who Kenny Omega thinks AEW could work with and would love to work with on a talent swap. Of course, we do have the biggest topics and trends this year. We are going to kind of do it a little bit different because this is a holiday episode. This is your Thanksgiving Day episode. We are going to future book some of these awesome storylines that we've got going on in wrestling right now. Of course, we're going to take a look and we're going to recap uh, what took place at Survivor Series. Again, I'm your host, Adam the Jock Strozinski, and doing it with me, as always. I could not have asked for a better podcast partner. He's the one. He is the only. He is the Doc John Macaroon. Cuz, did I get the episode number correct this week? Yes, you're on point, baby. Yes! Now we're starting off on the right foot. Episode 159, <laughs> about to kick off. I really did enjoy Survivor Series, and I'm glad we're going to get a chance to recap. And uh, I can't wait. Stay tuned to see who won the challenge. Listen to the inflection in my voice. You can maybe yeah, get a little sense. <laughs> okay, so it was good. But here's the thing I was thinking throughout. Very good wrestling. I was excited. AJ Styles' music kicked it off. But then I said to myself as the show went on, do I really care about any of this? No. And I said to myself, <laughs> no. I'm, I'm liking it because it's a wrestling show. But what the fuck is the point of all this? <laughs> and I said to myself, okay, and it really, I really said to myself, wow. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to challenge myself. And to your point, because we didn't talk about it, I said to myself, I could have wrote the ending of The Undertaker so much better. And I said to myself, man, you know what it is? It's formulaic. They're going through the motion. We need a pay-per-view. We need to have this happen. And so that's what they did. And I said to myself, just basics, okay? It's unfortunate for The Undertaker. He closes out the show. He does a quick promo. He has his entrance. It's fine. But then you just have the, you know, hologram of Paul Bear and you go to the back and you end it, which is straightforward. Wasn't that kind of weird, though, like the, the, the whole thing with Paul Bear? It was weird. It was a little bit strange. It's strange, but it's, it's paying homage to a big part of The Undertaker, which is no problem. You're using technology. Not a problem. But what do you do in wrestling? You open up for some debate. You open up for some talk about, ooh, what if? All you had to do, and this is what I wrote. Undertaker standing there, hands up, you go to the hologram, lights go out for a second, boom, Sting standing there, right? He's just standing there looking at the Undertaker, Undertaker's in shock, just standing there, you have a moment. You don't do nothing, you don't move, you just pan onto that camera, that shot, Sting looking at the Undertaker. Now, you're never going to put an old ass Sting against the Undertaker in a real match, it could, be, could happen, but... You open the discussion. And if it's not Sting, if you just want to use Bray Wyatt, the guy that's had a history with him, you do that and you open up, oh, does he come back for Mania? Does he come back? What's going on? Is this real? Is this really the end? Instead, you went formulaic, really light, and it dampered the mood because it's like, dude, this guy put in 30 years and piped in stuff, piped in reactions. That's not worthy. It wasn't. It was good. It was the best part of the show. It was cool to see. Everyone wanted to see the entrance. Everybody wanted to see it. But you didn't, you hit a lot of B pluses at Survivor Mm -hmm. Series. And Survivor Series, Royal Rumble, WrestleMania, SummerSlam, you need to hit A's. You need to hit future stuff. You need to hit like, what's going to happen? And instead, I just found myself going, this is a show. It's a wrestling show. Not a lot of things that were intriguing to make me go, man, I got to watch this again. Great matches, good quality card you want to watch. Definitely the the fight of the night was, in my opinion, it was uh, Drew McIntyre and Roman Reigns. They went at it, and they had themselves a brawl, told a good story, and it was great. All around good wrestling, but bottom line, it didn't live up to the sizzle in which a Survivor Series should. And, And the bottom line, Vince McMahon is putting together a formula. What do people want? What kind of 
Do we got to do to get a show out there? Let's go do it. You don't have enough big stars. You don't have enough wow. You don't have the wow factor. You don't have the surprise. You ran a show and ha- didn't really have a surprise. It was crazy. Yeah. So there's not a whole lot I can really add to what you said because same thoughts, right? I don't care about any of these matches because none of this has anything to do with long-term booking. The best part of the show was the end with The Undertaker. And arguably the best match that took place was what you got with Roman Reigns and Drew McIntyre. And like you said, Survivor Series is one of your big four. And it has felt almost as if it is an afterthought. It feels as almost as if it is it is just there on the calendar and we have to do this. Because this whole red versus blue brand thing, it, it just doesn't work. And I think we talked about it when we did our when we did our our preview of Survivor Series. It it just I don't know. It doesn't help with the storytelling. All that being said, we kicked off with an inner brand battle royal, and that's what got Survivor Series started on the pre-show. Miz ends up winning it. He slides into the ring and eliminates Dominic, who thought he had won the whole damn thing. So Miz wins the inner inner brand battle royal. Then we quickly move into the Team Raw versus Team SmackDown portion for the men. And this was a little bit weird to me because Team Raw defeated Team SmackDown 5 nothing. Seth Rollins was the first one to get eliminated. He basically offered himself up to, to Sheamus, who booted him in the face, and he was disposed of very, very quickly. I thought as this kind of played out, it was 5 to nothing. And I know we're doing this whole thing with Jey Uso. We're doing this whole thing with Roman Reigns. And I thought as this played out, I thought the way this was going to go is they were going to get down 5-1, to one, and then all of a sudden Jey was going to start kicking ass and taking names. And it was gonna it was gonna kind of turn on a dime, but it's not what happened. Jay Uso ends up losing. Team Raw defeats Team SmackDown five nothing, and then we end up getting a fantastic match between the Street Profits and the New Day. What did you think of this match? Because for me, I loved every aspect of this. This was a great match to give uh, a new tag team like the Street Profits quite a bit of rub by defeating the New Day. The New Day were were heels, heels to the finest in this, which is something a little bit different because the New Day, they, they started off as a heel trio and then they kind of everybody fell in love with them and they became these these baby faces. And, and it's really weird. They played the heel role in this tag team match so well. I thought this was such a well done match with great athleticism and each one of these teams stealing each other's moves. It was great. I thought that it was intriguing at least to see the New Day potentially being heels. I thought the Street Profits looked the part. And that's all you could ask for is that they were able to go toe-to-toe with the New Day and they got the W. And I think it was great because of the fact that, hey, it kind of had the feeling of the passing of the torch and the honor at the end. It was nice to see everybody embrace the show of respect. And I like the Street Profits. I like what they're what they're capable of. I think you need to highlight them more. I think you got to kind of take away a little bit of that hokey Street Profit type thing, that little bit of, hey, what's going on? And, and, and you know, a little bit of, like, tone down that part of it and up the physicality. I think these dudes are believable. Like, they could be legit heels too. And I think potentially you could tap into that. Something interesting in the future, the future book, is to have them turn heel, you know, maybe align in the future with the New Day and only to turn on them and then have the Street Profits be heels. I think they got a better heel potential than the New Day, in my mind. So I think what you're kind of saying is, is maybe make them a little bit more serious, which I don't necessarily mind if you make the Street Profits a little bit more serious. We then got Bobby Lashley defeating Sami Zayn. I thought this was kind of a, a crap match. I didn't really like it. Sasha Banks defeat Asuka. Again, I picked Asuka. I don't know what the hell I was smoking. I was I was deranged and crazed when I made that selection. I it, like the, the most logical picking here was Sasha Banks defeating Asuka. We then had the team, we had the, the, the female team Raw taking on the females from Team SmackDown. Now, this was kind of weird. And it leads to, to a, a double-ended question for me for you. Lana ends up winning. She's the sole survivor. She, during this match, gets told to stand on the steps. She starts crying. She basically cries for 15 minutes just standing on the steps as everybody in her team gets eliminated. It comes down to Bianca Belair and Nia Jax. And Bianca Belair lifts Nia Jax over the barricade. And as she goes to climb back into the ring, she gets counted out with Nia Jax. So Bianca Belair was the last person left for SmackDown. So Team SmackDown's eliminated. 
Nia Jax was the second to last person for Team Raw. So by all of this, Lana is now the sole survivor. She wins. It's supposed to be this big crowning moment for her. My question to you is, does this help or hurt Lana? And does this help or hurt Bianca Belair? Because this to me was a match that Bianca Belair should have won. It would be like her taking out Baszler and, and taking out a Nia Jax was basically a, a crowning moment for her because it was two on one. She takes them both out. And then all she had to do was, was basically defeat Lana. Uh, Lana could have got a little bit of a rub off of Bianca Belair, who just got a ton of shine off of the, the, the women's tag team champions. And I felt like you could have done this a lot different. Instead. I feel like Bianca Belair gets hurt a little bit by this. And I don't think you did anything to make Lana look any more lethal or any more credible. Exactly. Do you feel like it was a joke? Like, what, what was yeah, I, it, it was play. I don't think it hit the intended mark in regards to what happened. But hey, she ended up being the sole survivor, baby, of the, of the winning team. Yeah, I just I thought it was I thought it was poorly executed. I thought it was a bad job by WWE and their booking team. Reigns and Drew McIntyre, like we've already discussed, had the match of the night. It was fantastic. It was such a good match. I don't think this hurts Drew McIntyre in the least bit. He ends up losing to Roman Reigns. Jay Uso gets involved in this. And it's basically the 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 turning point in the match. Uh, Roman Reigns quickly ends up pinning him for the one, two, three. I thought this was a fantastic match. Yeah, absolutely. Man, what an exciting, exciting matchup, huh, Cuz? Where'd you, where'd you yeah. It just was really good, entertaining, and really did the job all, all in all, start to finish. Great storytelling, too, which is, I think, something that we come to expect from these performers. Exactly. And, and like you said, the, the farewell to The Undertaker was arguably the best part of the entire pay-per-view. Now, with the leader of the pack here, you obviously get the entire point because yeah. you had Sasha Banks and you had Bobby Lashley. I don't know what the hell I was smoking. You take another five-point lead. You now are, are, are pulling me up by my bootstraps. It's 11 and a half to six and a half. It's, it's not a good look for me. I've got to do some work. So with this being... A, a holiday edition and uh, we're recording this very early in the week so we can get this out to everybody. We are going to do things a little bit different. Normally we take something that took place this week in wrestling and then we kind of talk about it and we discuss what we liked about it, what we didn't like about it. What we're going to do now is we're going to take some of the bigger storylines that are going on in wrestling right now and we're going to try to future book them. How, how would we like to see these things play out? For instance, on SmackDown, I don't think you can make the argument that the best thing going on SmackDown right now is the whole Roman Reigns story. So what I would love to see with Roman Reigns is I want to see him continue on this path of I'm the head of the table. I'm the head of the of the 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 Samoan family. I am the future of this business. I am that guy. And he brings Jay and he brings Jimmy Uso in underneath his wings and I want this to continue to build and I want his ego to get bigger and I want him to become more maniacal and I want him to become angrier and I want him to become more and more evil until that white knight comes riding in and that white knight challenges him to a WrestleMania match. And that white knight is his cousin, The Rock. And what happens is we go to WrestleMania this year and you've got Roman Reigns versus The Rock and Roman Reigns dismantles The Rock and makes The Rock say that he is head of the table and makes him slot in. So everybody now has to buy into Roman Reigns because The Rock basically just got his ass whipped by his cousin and has said he is the head of the Samoan family. He is the man. He is legitimately the big dog. That's how I would love to see the Roman Reigns storyline on SmackDown play out going forward. Okay, so the White Knight's The Rock, huh? Yep. The White Knight's The Rock to save everybody, huh? So The Rock against Roman Reigns, man, that'd be, mm -hmm. that'd be something else, huh? That'd be a real good match, good, good storytelling. That would be something else, too. It would be something where, you know, Roman Reigns gets put in his place and maybe even get, goes over. Maybe even The Rock does the job and uh, lets Roman Reigns carry over in the future. See, mm -hmm. I, I think a little bit differently. I think that they should definitely go with this for a lot longer, that the Usos and Roman Reigns run roughshod all over SmackDown until the next person comes in. Maybe it's Daniel Bryan. Maybe it's somebody else along the way that can, uh, you know, stand up. You know, maybe it's Baron Corbin. Maybe it's somebody else that steps up to the plate that's going to be next. But for the time being, maybe it's even a blast from the past. I know you wouldn't like it, but Brock Lesnar, 
You know, somebody mm-hmm. that comes back to maybe go, hey, I got to reclaim my manager. You took really Paul Heyman, and then you, you have uh, Brock cost Roman Reigns a title and, and things like that. So in the future, you got to have more intrigue. You definitely have to, like you said, spice it up a little bit because now basically it's Roman and everybody else. So that's the problem you have now when you've distinguished him that far ahead. So it's going to be wild to see. But I think Brock Lesnar's got to get back in the mix. I can't believe that in this time, you know, money must be really tight if you didn't have Brock Lesnar show up at Survivor Series. Yeah, it was kind of weird not having him there, huh? It was really weird. I thought he'd show up. I thought a tease, you know, maybe play the music a little bit, shock everybody. It was just, I just think it, it basically Survivor Series was devoid of that one big, oh, the big pop. Good wrestling show, but we, nobody jumped out of their seat. Yeah, it wasn't bad, but it felt like it sure as heck could have been a lot better. So let, let's transition over to Raw. So on Raw, you have The Miz. He's the holder of the Money in the Bank briefcase. How would you book him going forward with the Money in the Bank briefcase? Man, when does he cash it in? You could even mm-hmm. tease. You could even tease it then at, at Survivor Series. He comes out, boom. You know, he stands there and, and, and says, "I'm the next guy for you, Drew McIntyre or Roman Reigns." And just tease it a little bit. But you know, obviously, he's got to go. He's got to challenge uh, Drew McIntyre, right? For because he's on Raw. Uh, you would think he doesn't yeah. have to. He no, can challenge anybody who wants to. Yeah. So how, when, sh- when, and how should uh, I think Miz should carry it out way longer? I think that he should just tease it and really work it to WrestleMania or beyond, or almost the year mark. And then I think after that, you have the feud. After potentially, if you decide that Drew McIntyre drops the belt to somebody, maybe it's the next person. Uh, if he drops it to Keith Lee, if he drops it to potentially. Uh, AJ Styles or Randy Orton again. I just think that you save, it doesn't seem right, Miz and Drew McIntyre right now. I think Drew McIntyre needs the top, top, top end of the card, which is AJ Styles, the big, big dog names. I think you you save Miz for maybe the next champion uh, so that he's the the, the the third next title holder. So it's going to be Drew McIntyre, then whoever he gives it up to next, and then you have uh, the Miz cashing in against whoever it may be. But you you, you play it out. you got to let this go longer. You can play this out in future feuds and in things like that. See, I think I'm more on the, on the let's expedite this just a little bit. Get him the so bell. we've got tables, ladders, and chairs coming up. And we've got all these guys on Raw vying for the number one contender spot. And whoever that is, I believe, is going to get a chance to take on Drew McIntyre at tables, ladders, and chairs. I would have the Miz cash in on whomever challenges Drew McIntyre at tables, ladders, and chairs. And that would be, I mean, it's it's supposed to be a brutal battle, right? So if the Miz loses it here, I don't think it's that bad. I don't think it I don't think it hurts that much. But I would have Miz cash it in, I'd have Miz win it. Uh, whether it's on Drew or AJ Styles or whomever is going to be that number one contender, Keith Lee, whomever. I would have Miz cash it in, and then I'd have him win win the uh, win the strap. So we'll go to NXT. What do you think is up next for Undisputed Era and for the brand? I just wanna I just wanna remind you that we do have war games coming up, and I do believe this is where these two teams are going to end up meeting. But I want to know what the fallout is going to be between these two because. These two squads, these two four-man parties seem very interlocked and very intertwined with each other, at least as of right now. And going into this whole thing with For the Brand, we were supposed to have both Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly turn babyface, while Roderick Strong and Bobby Fish were supposed to turn heel, and there was supposed to be some tension in Undisputed Era. As of right now, it looks like that's been put on hold, and you've got them solely focused on for the brand being led by Pat McAfee. So where do you think this this storyline goes? How would you like to see this unfold? Man, <laughs> that's the toughest one too, right? Do, do, you yeah. have, do you have the Undisputed Era battle each other again? Do you have – see, bringing back Undisputed Era was fine. It was cool. It, it, it's cute so you can feud with another faction. But I think – I'm just going to keep it simple. You just break up the Undisputed Era. They, they, they work together to help uh, Adam Cole defeat the brand and then you move on and then you just have Adam Cole. You got to move on from it. You got to move up. I know it failed before. You can, Adam Cole does not deserve to be in NXT anymore. I think Roderick Strong has got to be somebody that's featured. You Maybe you give him, you get him in the mix a little bit for the NXT title and you get him a little bit more exposure. But Undisputed Era is great, but I just, it was, it, it's been there, done that. They've done everything, right? So I think that, obvi- you know what? 
you could have it disintegrate. I think probably what's best for business is the brand to go over. Pat McAfee to kind of do his thing and establish that brand as the elite faction in NXT, and you have them rough, run rough shot until somebody else wants to step up. But Undisputed Era's got to lose, and they got to move on, and they got to feature other people. Yeah, I think it's time for Undisputed Era to, to break away from NXT, and I don't know if they want to break away from NXT, and I don't necessarily blame them. Uh, some really good storylines and good booking in NXT compared to what we get up at the blue or the red brand. Uh, I think, obviously, these two teams will meet at War Games. There will be there will be some type of fallout from their meeting. All that being said, I think if you're for the brand, which I think is one of the worst names for a faction ever, I think... They've got to go over, and I think they need to add somebody. I don't know who, but I feel like they have to add another piece, and they've got to play a role in beating Undisputed Era. And I'm not even sure if I'm not even sure if Finn Balor, because it was really weird for Finn Balor to come back and basically announce his return, but then introduce Undisputed Era. I thought that was really strange. I think if you can somehow work Finn Balor in with Undisputed Era, and you kind of have almost this revamping of of what the Bullet Club was in NXT, or not in NXT, in, in New Japan uh, and in Ring of Honor here in NXT, I think that would be really, really interesting. If you could somehow get AJ Styles to go back and forth and play on both NXT and be on Raw, I think it would be fantastic if you could somehow work that out. Hmm, Okay. Do you like what Pat McAfee's evolved into? I do. I love Pat McAfee. I find him to be so interesting. He's so great. Uh, like the guy cuts a fantastic promo and gets you so interested. I was dying last week when he was cutting his promo and he was like, and they're dead. And then he's dead. <laughs> I, I thought it was great. It was fantastic. Let's switch over to AEW real quick before we get into some news and notes. So John Moxley and Kenny Omega obviously have a match coming up. Looks to be a, a massive deal. Who does John Moxley end up dropping his title to and win? Because John Moxley uh, is apparently a dad to be, and not not necessarily very soon, but in the next couple months, John Moxley is about to be a father. So, at what point does he kind of step away to go home and, and do some some daddy duties? And who does he drop this belt to? Oh man, that's a tough one, huh? Because uh, it's been such a great run, like it's really given prestige to the title. Do you just let him go away without dropping it? Do you give it to Kenny Omega? Oh man, that's a tough one. Oh, man, how would I fantasy book John Moxley because of the fact that, you know, obviously he's going to need some family time. I, one thought would be to let him keep it. You just let him, you know, take a couple of weeks off, fight one time and boom, you take a month off. But how, how long is John Moxley really going to want to stay at home with the new baby? Two weeks, three weeks at most, you know, before he has one match? Because the AEW schedule is not that expansive. One pay-per-view every three you know, every three months or two months or so, and then boom. Or do you say, you know what? Does the the cleaner get the job done and avenge a loss and go nasty? You know, you remember some of the brutal early matches that Omega and Moxley had? Does he take like a, a light bulb and, yeah, it, probably as I'm talking through it, Kenny Omega takes a light bulb and just smashes it over the head and gets vicious with John Moxley and it's just an injury and uh, puts him out of action as Kenny Omega takes the title. It's got to be Omega, right? There's only one other person that has the name brand that would probably put the the title in, in, in the, the same prestige and respect as John Moxley has, and that's Kenny Omega. Yeah, I think it's I think Kenny Omega takes the belt off of him. I don't see it as a, a vicious match like that, but Kenny, I think Kenny Omega goes so far right to be a heel, he basically outdoes everybody else. So I don't think he does anything sadistic in, in I don't think they have a hardcore match. I think this is a straight up wrestling match, but I think this is where he does some very undermined things. And I think he goes very, very hard to the right to become a heel. I think he goes so far, right? What happens is he kind of drives a wedge between both himself and the young bucks. And I think what ends up happening is I think hangman page might be the, might be the coin that kind of gets flipped here. Right? So I think, you end up having Kenny Omega beat John Moxley, goes full blown heel. I think what you end up having is the Young Bucks come out, they celebrate with him, and they're just kind of like, he's a little bit off. He's not all there. It, it's not real great right now. I think Hangman Page ends up challenging Omega, and Omega goes even more extreme. And I think what you have is you have Hangman become white meat babyface, and I think you have the Young Bucks come to his side, and I think it drives this 
wedge even deeper between Omega and between the Young Bucks and Hangman Page. Kenny goes off to kind of do his own thing by himself as his dastardly heel. And you have the Young Bucks become baby faces along with Hangman Page. So it, I think it'll be interesting, but I think John Moxley drops it to Kenny Omega. Mm, absolutely. AW about to get funky, got to get aggressive and things like that. I do want to make a quick point before you do news and notes. Raw following Survivor Series made no sense. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it literally made no logical sense, some of the things that were happening. Highlighted by the fact that I'm a fan of the Hurt Business, right? So one of their members has an opportunity for a title match. So what do you do? How do you write it? You have another member of his team get him disqualified, which makes no logical sense. If you're trying to get the title, you have the Hurt Business, you flatten them. <sighs> okay, whatever. I, I, I just don't, you know, there were some good matches all in all, but by and large, Raw just left me scratching my head going, what are they doing? It's like, do they not? think long term do they not want to elevate people why would you why would you hurt the hurt business when they're title holders why would you have you know uh mvp get his guy disqualified why why would you do any of that but bra continues to be a show that you just got a dvr not watch it watch it in spurts read the dirt sheets because it made no sense it didn't really build a whole heck of a lot other than the fact that you know, the part that I like the best, obviously, is AJ Styles is next in line. But it's just tough to believe that AJ Styles is going to defeat Drew McIntyre. So it's good. It's really good for Drew that if the writing goes according to how I think it's going to go, you're going to have a great match, but Drew's going to get get over and, and be able to defeat AJ Styles. And that's good because AJ's a legend and it'll be a good match. But other than that, you know, Randy Orton and The Fiend is coming around again. But we've seen that, and it's kind of been something that we all thought was going to happen. Other than that, you look at it and you say, you could have skipped Raw this week. There's nothing there that's going to make you go, wow, go forward, woohoo, nothing too much there. So skip it, get on to the week at hand, NXT, AEW, that's where this stuff is going on. Like we said, no impact review, but uh, I'll, I'll review a couple big themes on the next episode. All right, cuz, hit me with this week's professional wrestling news and notes. What made your list this week? Okay, so according to Dave Meltzer, WWE is saving Big E and Lars Sullivan. That's why they did not take part in Survivor Series. Meltzer said that WWE wants to push Big E and Sullivan to the top of SmackDown, and having them as part of the pre-show battle royal would not have helped their cause. WWE also wanted to save Big E for his entrance with the New Day, which saw the men come out in their Gears of War-inspired gear. The New Day members are playable characters in the new Gears of War video game, and Sullivan is seen as the SmackDown version of Braun Strowman, according to Meltzer. Dave Meltzer is also reporting that WWE has given up on Aleister Black. In a recent episode of the Wrestling Observer Radio, Meltzer said WWE doesn't have any plans for him. Black's push was part of Paul Heyman's doing, and since Paul Heyman has been removed from creative, there's really nobody going to bat for him, and that's kind of why he's been a, a rudderless ship on WWE's television. Now, during an appearance on Wrestling Observer Radio, Kenny Omega explained that he's all about a potential re relationship involving a talent switch between AEW and WWE in the future. He said, end quote, if for some reason WWE came knocking on the door and said, hey, we'd love to do a talent switch or a trade-off or work together on something, I'd be all for it. Whatever benefits the wrestling fan must always come first. When you start thinking about fantasy scenarios, if wrestlers crossed over like, like that, it gets really exciting. And I think he's absolutely correct. AEW, WWE would be great. I think AEW and New Japan would be fantastic. Omega also revealed that he is currently working with a torn labrum and said that his trainer is helping him get through it. As long as he goes and sees him at least three times a week, he has full range of motion, he can lift, and he can work in the ring. So Kenny Omega obviously dealing with a little bit of a banged up shoulder. And that's all we have for this week's wrestling news and notes. Hope everybody had a happy Thanksgiving, and I hope everybody's having a great Black Friday. Absolutely. Make sure you follow Adam on Twitter at Adam R S T R O Z. Follow the network at Detroit Podcast. If you've agreed or disagreed with something that we said, if you had a totally different view, if you love Survivor Series, if you love Monday Night Raw, 
If you thought that Alexa Bliss was unreal, let us know because Raw had some moments. There were some good things about it as well. I just definitely looked at the thing collectively and I just was like, there's a lot of things here that don't make any sense logically. And so if there's anything at all that you want to talk about in the world of professional wrestling, hit us up at Detroit Podcast. Love the banter. We definitely love watching professional wrestling. Even though we complain about it, we definitely, our eyes are on it. And uh, kudos to The Undertaker, man. 30 years. Made you feel old for a moment when you realized, damn, it was 30 years to the exact moment. And I guess I do got to leave on a sour note, okay? Because I almost was going to send you a text, and I said it to my wife. Vince looks like a dead man alive. He Dude, literally looked he looked like, so bad. He, he, like, they he, dusted him off, the, like, brought him out of the mothballs. I said to Andrea, I said, dude looks like he's dead, embalmed, and is staring mm-hmm. at us. His face, he, she's like, he had some bad plastic surgery or something. I'm like, I don't know about men's plastic surgery and what it's supposed to look like, but I don't know. It's like they either overdid his makeup or underdid it. He looked dead. He looked like he had dead skin and yep. was there. I was like, whoa. It's like they took Vince. Like, you, you still have that picture of Vince when he was working with Stone Cold, right? Remember when he was like that youthful? That's how I will always that's, remember. That's him. how I will always remember Vince. Could you imagine having a meeting with Vince now? You'd be like, oh my God, this guy's going to die next week. I just got said to myself, he sounded lucid. He sounded like, okay, this guy's still pumping iron, but he's old man now. Like, he's old. And it's like, he got whoa. emotional. Did you see yeah. him get emotional when he was announcing The Undertaker? Like, him and The Undertaker go way back. Yeah, they have a really yeah. good relationship, and that's yeah. awesome. But he got really emotional. Yeah, because Undertaker is one of those rare guys that was loyal when everything happened with WCW, and he stayed. He was there. He was going to ride or die. And he said to Vince, you know, if you check in with those old documentaries, look, if this goes under, I'm going with you. And that's the kind of company guy he wanted in that Vince always knew if times were tough, I called The Undertaker. He helped out. And the toughest times, too, remember – WCW was close, ever so close to putting WWE out of business with how good things were going. If they just had just started to let other talent shine and let the likes of uh, Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit and Chris Jericho share. Yeah, you had a company that was reeling 83 weeks. It's unheard of to defeat the big brand. But my God, you got to tighten Vince up. You got to maybe get him a tan look or get some orange. But whatever that color was... Bro, that was death's color. I was like, oh my God, he looks dead, like a dead man talking. It was bad and it was noticeable and it was really bad. So Vince, come on, man, you're a billionaire. Can't be looking like that on TV nowadays. I don't know if HD, if it was my TV, just highlighted how bad it was. I was looking like, whoa, this is not a good look for the big boss of WWE. And with that, peace out. Talk next week on episode 160 of the Doc and Jock Wrestling Podcast.